there are dozens of cameras out there. So which one should you buy to take amazing bird images? When it comes to finding the perfect bird photography camera for you, there are many contributing factors, like the budget and your style of shooting. So rather than recommending a random camera to you, I want to look at what makes a camera ideal for bird photography, go through the features that I look for in a bird photography camera, so you can make an informed decision afterwards and find the perfect camera for you. If I had the choice between upgrading my lens or upgrading my camera, I would always go for the lens. Lenses hold their value much better than cameras, so they're a much better investment for you. And ultimately, a lens will stay much longer with you. Cameras come and go, but a lot of lenses stay with you for five or 10 years or longer. And lenses hold their value very well. For instance, my first 600 millimeter lens I bought for $6,000 and I sold it for $5,750 10 years later. So it cost me a total of $250 to have a lens for 10 years. Whereas during the same time frame, I had three or four cameras that I bought for a lot of money that were all pretty much worthless at the end of that 10 year span. I would also highly recommend against jumping between brands all the time. For my experience, this has never worked out for people when they jump between the brands. Because if you're only looking at the latest, coolest camera, you will have to jump between the brands all the time and all you do ultimately is lose a lot of money because you buy a new gear, sell it and take a hit. Full frame or crop? What's better? I must say it depends. I started out with a Canon 20D that had a 1.6 crop factor, then upgraded to a 1D Mark II N that had a 1.3 crop factor, Stuck with that for a long time until I sold my 1D Mark IV that also had a 1.3 crop factor and then started using a 5D Mark III and 5D Mark IV that were full frame cameras. I must say personally I never looked back and I never really felt like I'm missing the crop factor but I think that's also because I'm using a big 600mm prime lens and I can use teleconverters. But if you're using shorter lenses, especially zoom lenses like 100 to 400 or 150 to 600, that can't really take extend as well. I think using a 1.6 crop factor camera can be very appealing because you can increase your perceived reach with that lens dramatically from 400 millimeters on a full frame camera to something over 600 or over 800 millimeters on one of those zoom lenses. Recently I was shooting with a friend and he was using a Canon 7D Mark II on his 600 millimeter lens and I was using my 5D Mark IV on the same 600 millimeter lens and I had to stand a lot closer to the birds than he had to and I got a bit jealous at times so I could definitely see the appeal of the crop factor but then when we started to go into like a darker forest things turned around because I could use much higher ISO and got much better image quality and higher shutter speeds whereas on a high megapixel 1.6 crop factor camera the ISO range you can go to is fairly limited and you might get stuck especially in darker situations with very low shutter speed that they can limit you severely. Personally I'm liking full frame cameras because it also gives me more flexibility. If I'm shooting with a 1.6 crop factor camera on a 600 millimeter lens my reach is over 900 millimeters. So if a bird comes really close to me, for instance, when I'm shooting ducks on the duck ponds and they swim close by, I have way too much focal length. So in that case, I prefer to have the flexibility of shooting full frame at 600 millimeters, at my 1.4 extender to get to 840 millimeters, and at my two times extender to get to 1200 millimeters if I really have to. Whereas if I'm shooting with a 1.6 crop factor, I'm starting out at like 900 something millimeters and go to almost 1200 millimeters if I add the 1.4 extender. And many times that can just be too much focal length. So what are the main advantages of full frame? Better image quality, better ISO performance, and personally I think also more flexibility. So which one is best? I would personally always recommend a high megapixel, nice quality full frame camera. But if you're having a shorter lens and you know you're going to stick with that shorter lens, especially if it's a zoom lens for a long time, I think there can be a compelling case made for having a 1.6 crop factor that just gives you that more perceived reach and brings you closer to the birds in your viewfinder and ultimately might allow you to have better image quality because you have to crop much less. I think long term we will see more and more 1.6 crop factor cameras disappear and 
all the top of the line cameras like they already are will be full frame cameras with a lot of megapixels and I think more and more of you guys will also be shooting full frame and all I can say is don't be afraid of it it comes with a lot of advantages and I definitely love it. How many megapixels do we need? In the past I've shot with six and eight megapixels and make it work now I'm shooting with 30 but I'm also happy to use 50 or 60 in the future. What do more megapixels give us? Generally more flexibility. If you're shooting with just six megapixels there's not much scope to crop into your files but if you're shooting with 30 or 40 megapixels you can shoot a little bit wider and then crop in and still end up with a file that's nice and big so this is why megapixels are important for me because they add that extra flexibility in the field. What's the sweet spot for me? probably around the 30 megapixel mark at the moment. I'm shooting with a 5D Mark IV and I'm loving the 30 megapixels. So is there such a thing as too many megapixels? For me, not really. If the image quality is there, the ISO performance is still good, so the images are not too noisy, I'm happy to take any amount of megapixels because it adds so much flexibility for me. And storage is cheap these days, so even if one file is like 50 or 60 megabytes, we can still make it work. The next thing I'm looking for in a potential new camera is speed, especially frames per second and buffer size. We could have a camera that has 100 megapixel takes amazing photos but can only shoot one frame per second and that would be no good for bird photography because we all know birds move very fast so we have to have a decently high frame rate and a buffer that clears fast enough so we can take a lot of shots in a row and don't hit that buffer too soon and just get stuck with the camera and just going click, click, click because there's nothing more frustrating than that, is there? When it comes to the frames per second, I'm looking at at least six to eight frames per second to have enough speed to give me a good variety of shots in most situations. If you're specializing in flight shots, having a faster camera will certainly be advantageous for you because you're just getting more wing positions with the wings going up and down and overall increasing your odds of getting the shot. I'm often shooting with flash as well, so I don't need to have the highest frame rates because the flash can't really flash every shot if you're in high speed mode and trying to shoot a lot of frames. So most flashes can only shoot like four or five frames per second depending on your shutter speed. So personally for my style of photography, I don't need a camera that has like 20 frames per second. I wouldn't mind it, but for me, the 5D Mark IV with like six or eight frames per second and 30 megapixels has been a very good compromise. I got nice flight shots, I get nice singing poses, and I don't really feel like I'm missing anything. When it comes to the buffer size, I think it's not as much of a problem anymore these days with much faster cards and the buffers having a much bigger size inside the camera as well. The one thing I would be conscious of is some of the lower end kind of entry level cameras only have a buffer of like 10 shots and you might hit that buffer very, very soon. If you're shooting six or eight frames per second, but you can only buffer 10 shots and then it's writing to your card, you might get stuck in there pretty quickly and that's something you don't want to be in. After I've checked the megapixels and make sure that the frame rate suits my style and that the buffer can clear enough photos quickly enough, I'm usually looking at the autofocus and the autofocus system. In the past, not all cameras were able to focus with the 600 and the two times extender. And I think some of the lower entry point cameras might still have that limitation. So that's something I would be looking out for. If you're having a zoom lens, for instance, or 100 to 400, and you wanna use a 1.4 extender, that might bring the threshold beyond what the autofocus can do and you're limited to just one autofocusing point or you can't focus at all. So that's something that I would always be checking because you don't want to be stuck with just one point. When I look at the autofocus, the main thing I'm looking for is that the autofocus points are nicely spread out throughout your viewfinder and that they're all cross points. Because if they're not all cross points, then some points will be inferior to the others. And I like to move my autofocus points around. So all of them being equally good adds great benefit for me. When it comes to noise, I'm looking at usable ISO 1600 to 6400 because on a day like today, it's quite dull, but I'd like these shooting conditions and I will need at least ISO 1600 to 3200. So it's important to me that my camera has a usable ISO 1600 to 3200. 
all the full frame cameras I've used could definitely handle that range. And generally I think noise is a bit overblown. There's so many ways you can mitigate noise in the field by shooting light backgrounds for instance, or there's so many plugins that remove noise during the post-production process in Photoshop that it's not really a concern. I think the only time noise becomes a concern if there's a lot of pixels crammed onto a small sensor, typically on those 1.6 crop sensors that have 20, 30 or more megapixels where you have a lot of pixels on a small space so you show a lot more noise. And personally I would find that very limiting so that's one of the reasons I'm liking the full frame cameras because I can easily use much higher ISO and still get a clean file and just be more flexible when it comes to the conditions I'm shooting in. For years I thought it was stupid to include video in all these cameras and now things have changed. I'm taking a lot of videos and I'm very happy that my cameras have great video functionalities and I'm actually now looking at new cameras through the video eye as well seeing what features do they have, do they shoot 4K or even more, do they have high frame rate so I can do some slow motion. So this has become actually very important for me now. I never thought I would take a lot of bird videos but now it has become one of my most popular content and I really enjoy taking videos like these YouTube videos or just videos of birds in the field that added a whole new dimension to what I do. So video capabilities have become very important for me now so I'm definitely looking at the new cameras through that eye and I'm looking for 4K hopefully with 60 or even 120 frames per second and I mean some of the new cameras shoot 6 or 8K. I take it, I don't think we really need it at this stage but it can never hurt to have some future-proof technology or just simply being able to crop into an 8K file from a bird that's a bit further away and still get good video quality out of it. What we haven't talked about yet is the budget. We all have a budget, we'd all love to buy the top of the line camera, don't worry about money at all, but that's not really how it works, is it? So it's important that you find the right camera with the right features within your budget. This is not the sexiest recommendation, but I think a good way to mitigate your budget and your budget constraints is to buy a used camera of the previous generation. For instance, there will be an EOS R5 coming out soon. I assume that a lot of 5D Mark IVs will become available. And a lot of people don't actually use their camera much. They buy it and then it sits in their cupboard for three, four years and then they sell it for two or three thousand dollars less. And this is where I think you could pick up a fantastic camera. Don't go for the newest, the hottest thing on the block like an EOS R5 that's likely going to cost four, five, six thousand dollars. Go for a used Canon EOS 5D Mark IV that might only cost $2,800. So I think that's a good way to kind of get a great camera on a budget. So far I've mainly talked about DSLR cameras, but what about mirrorless? Mirrorless is clearly the future. If we look at all manufacturers, that's where it's heading. And there's some exciting new cameras coming out like the EOS R5 very soon that have amazing features, features we couldn't really have thought of in a DSLR camera. So I'm excited to try those out for you and let you know what I think about them. It's quite a big change. There's a lot of things attached to it, like you might need new lenses or adapters. So it's a big change, but it's also an exciting change. So I think we're all witnessing the end of the DSLR over the next few years. So what's your opinion on that? Are you excited about mirrorless? Are you not looking forward to it? Are you hoping DSLRs will stick around for a long time? Let me know in the comments. Personally, I'm pretty excited about the new features and functions and video capabilities that the mirrorless sector seems to offer. So let's summarize what I'm looking for in a new camera. I want it to be full frame. I want it to have at least 30 megapixels. I want it to be fast, so at least six to eight or 10 frames per second. I want it to have a decent sized buffer so I don't run into the buffer too quickly and the camera slows down too much. I want it to have decent autofocus with all the autofocus points being nicely spread out and available to me even when I'm using the extenders. And I want it to have a decent noise performance and great video features. And ideally, all that on a price that's not too crazy. What's your perfect camera? Which camera are you using now? Let me know in the comments and let me know the features that you're looking for when it comes to buying a new bird photography camera. I hope I could give you a bit of a guideline when it comes to buying a camera because what camera should I buy is one of the most 
commonly asked questions that I get. So instead of just saying, buy a Canon EOS R5 or buy a Nikon D850, I thought I'd rather look into what features should we actually have in a camera for bird photography so you can make your own decision based on your budget and what you want and your style of shooting. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give me a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel down there and I'll see you in one of my next videos. Bye.